Good. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Wow, it's a lot of people here. Um, so hello, my name is Dan Wong, and I'm the owner of a paddling business up in, up in all the way up in Yellowknife. Um, so I'm really honored to be here. This is my first uh, wil canoe wilderness symposium. I literally like just walked in half an hour ago. And we flew in a couple days ago, and I have a bunch of staff working the outdoor adventure trade show. And we've been living out in that desolate area by the airport, three of us sharing a hotel room in amongst the other hotels, the planes, and the sketchy restaurants. And so it's nice to come here and be part of a, you can feel the sense of community already. Trade show is getting a bit transactional, so. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, my, this is the business that I started um, uh, four summers ago. So we're entering our fifth summer, so we're fairly new. And, you know, we do um, Paddle Canada canoe and kayak courses. We're doing youth paddle camps, uh, canoe and gear rentals out of Yellowknife, Fort Smith, Anuvik, and Norman Wells, and uh, guided canoe and, and kayak uh, expeditions. And... Um, I guess through that is why I'm here, because uh, Alex Hall passed his business to uh, us, to me, um, before he passed away on March 2nd last year, and I don't really think I need to do much introduction in terms of Alex Hall, who he is. I think you guys, you know, if you're not aware of who he is, I think, you, you, you know, you'll learn through the presentation, but I, I do know that um, that uh, Monty Hummel's presentation to you guys last year, um, that really meant a lot to, to Alex. He did, you know, he did see that before he passed away, and that meant a lot to, um, to a lot of Northerners and people in Fort Smith and Alex's family members. And Alex, he was talking to me about the invite that Alex gave him to come here for quite some time, but he was pretty realistic that he wasn't gonna be able to make it pretty early on. He was going through chemo and radiation, and he really wanted to come here. It was a huge honor for him to be invited here to speak, and unfortunately he couldn't make it, but you know, when he saw the presentation from Monty and the standing ovation you guys gave him, uh, at the end of that, uh, it, it really did mean a lot. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for that. So, um, so this is Alex in uh, November um, uh, 2019, uh, I guess that would have been 2018, um, at the Tourism Association. Alex and I, Alex got a, a Lifetime Achievement Award there. So, um, so that's the, the, the best photo I have of us together. Um, and Alex was a very detailed man. And he, uh, he, you know, I think back to the year from his diagnosis to his death, and they, the doctors were pretty accurate. They said, you have about a, a year to live. You have uh, pretty bad cancer, um, and it's moved into your spine. And, and Alex actually spent quite a bit of time with me during that year. And, you know, I didn't really think about that till later, but you know, if you if doctor says you have a year to live, and Alex was very realistic, and I, you know, basically was planning to die and you know hoping to live, but very realistic about the whole thing. You know, like he, we spent Thanksgiving together, three days, just him and I, going over maps, going over details, campsites, him just passing on information to me and me writing everything down as much as I could. And we did this several times. We met up when he was coming through Yellowknife for treatment. He's, he invested quite a bit of time into making sure that we were going to be able to continue on what he was doing um, when time was, was more valuable than it ever was. So this is one of Alex's, this is like just a corner of one of Alex's 250K maps. And he had like several of these maps. And he, he didn't really need the maps, like he didn't take them out into the field with him. They pretty much lived at home. But... Um, he uh, he just had so much knowledge and so much information about the Thelon River and the Central Barrens um, and really stands alone amongst Canadian canoe guides in terms of like his love and dedication to that this this specific area and um, and so we uh, yeah we you know 
we did the best we, we could to pass on this information, but unfortunately a lot was lost with Alex when he passed away. There's only so much you can translate from like a 250K map to our 50K maps. And there's just so much that, so much knowledge that Alex had that was, that was lost with him. Um, and we now create our own stories as we follow in his footsteps. So this is the, this is the plane coming in. Um, so Alex was, uh, his, his ashes were returned to the barren lands um, on August 12, 2019. And Northwestern Air Lease out of Fort Smith, they sponsored a flight in with their single otter to a very beautiful, spectacular spot that Alex had chosen. And so this is the plane. It's just touched down. Um, and in, in the plane are Alex's uh, four children, his wife, and a pilot, Barry, that would often fly him in and out of the Barrens. And uh, yeah, this is the spot that, uh, that, they, that Alex chose. And um, this is where his ashes were, uh, were spread. And this is his family members. And you can see his daughter on the right there and his wife, uh, his daughter Esme and his wife Robin Hall, wearing the traditional Alex Hall shirt that he would wear. I think he had about 20 or 25 of these uh, ready to go. Uh, um, and he would, uh, he would actually put Velcro like between the, the buttons um, so the black flies couldn't get in and advise guests to do the same. So um, yeah, it's just a really amazing spot. Uh, we had actually, we were leading our Elk River trip. Um, you know, we were running Alex's five trips, his lineup of five trips. Alex never had other guides with him. He was a one-man operation his whole 43-year career. So Alex could only run as many trips as he, as he could run in the short summer season out in the Central Barrens. And so this would have been the fourth out of the five trips in his lineup. And we had a group actually coming to this spot, but they, they left the, the morning that the, the, the plane came in to drop the ashes. And so the plane came in, they spread the ashes, they had a typical Alex Hall lunch. I never was on a trip with Alex. But I've, was anybody here on a trip with Alex? Wow, that's amazing, a couple people. So, um, quite a few people actually. So you guys would, would know what that's all about. Um, I guess it involved Wausau crackers, peanut butter, jelly, a giant chocolate bar, um, Wasa bread, yeah, the Wasa bread, Wasa crackers, some. Kool-Aid, <laughs> Kool-Aid or Tang, I think was the brand. Um, a bunch, some canned fish products, maybe. Um, I from so you know I've um, been learning about Alex's trips through people that have been on the on his trips and reached out to me with these stories. I guess lunch was really uh, where it was at. Um, and actually, I'd like to follow up with some of you because I think we're going to be doing a we're going to pick one of our lunches to do a traditional Alex Hall lunch. On, on our trips for next summer and beyond. So I'd like to figure out exactly what I need to bring to make that happen. Um, so they, they had a traditional lunch, uh, built a rock cairn, um, and dropped the ashes. Yeah, so that was in August of, uh, that was August 12th when Alex returned to the Barrens. So let, let's rewind a bit to our first trip out. So the first trip that Alex uh, would, would run in a summer if it sold, and all the trips sold for last year, five of them basically sold out, um, was on the Tolston River, because the Tolston River, um, you know, he liked the Tolston River, he had a great route on the upper Tolston River, and it melted, uh, you know, you could access that, that, that area, and the trip was supposed to leave on June 11th. Um, and that's the date that Alex had picked. That was the, what he'd figured out after all those years as the best date. So as you know, it was a very, very late spring in the north last uh, summer. It messed up a lot of people's plans. So we had actually, to make things worse, we had moved the dates up by two days. We had changed Alex's plans because the clients on the trip really wanted a 10-day trip. They didn't want an eight-day trip. They wanted a 10-day trip. He said, okay, instead of flying in June 11th, we'll fly in June 9th. So we're flying in, we're flying in, and we're basically seeing ice everywhere, everywhere as we're getting pretty much close to the drop point. And miraculously, on that small little area that Alex had marked to land, we could land. So there was 
it was a very small lake. Maybe there was a little bit of current flowing in and out, so we could touch down. But we basically touched down into winter conditions, full-on winter, like 25 kilometer an hour, 30 kilometer an hour, cold biting winds, snow everywhere. Uh, we immediately put on all of our warm clothes, and it was like, you know, Fort Smith was nice and sunny when we, where we had left it, and we were frozen solid for two days. And then, of course, June 11th rolls around, and it's like a 15 degrees change in temperature, like literally 15 degrees. The sun comes out, it's like beautiful skies, and it's like this for the rest of the trip. So, of course, we all just thought like, of course, right? Of course. So we, d you know, and it's like, it was like that the whole summer. Whenever we like tweaked something with Alex's plans, it just like went totally wrong. <laughs> and there was a couple other instances like that and it was nothing like majorly wrong, but there was, yeah. Um, we definitely learned like that there was, yeah, to, maybe it wasn't a good idea to start like changing the plans. Let's at least do the first summer like exactly according to Alex's design and then we can go from there after. But this was an interesting trip because on our, on our upper Tolston River route, we, uh, we, you know, as a guide team, we didn't really know if we could do the route. Like, well, as the guide and client team for that matter, because there was just ice everywhere. So we basically had to do one of these you know, trips where you just, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, every day the lake is changing, it's very dynamic, the ice is candling, it's melting, and you're just finding a way through or hoping to find a way through when you get to the end of the lake. Um, so it was a, it was basically, uh, yeah, a few days of just using the canoes as, as icebreakers. And this was really, you know, I guess if you can consider the Upper Tolston part of the Central Barrens, I guess it's in the transition zone, this would be my first time. And this was the first time any of our guides did any of these routes. So we were strictly going off the maps that Alex, you know, the information that Alex has provided us, um, you know, we knew where to start, we knew where to stop, we knew all the campsites, we had all the notes on the rapids, like detailed notes, we had the best fishing spots, but we were discovering this all for the first time, and like we told everybody, you know, obviously this was the case, and you know, people were, most people, you know, like there was a certain percentage of people that were like, no, I'm not really into that, you know, I wanted to go with Alex and I can't now, so I'll do something else, but nine out of the other nine out of 10 people, they, they, they were, they were, they were down and it was, they actually found that it was exciting for them that the trip was exploratory for everybody. And the area was just amazing. You know, there's like these, I mean, I, mean, I don't need to tell this to you guys, you guys, um, many of you have been out there, but it's like these manicured, um, almost like Japanese gardens with these uh, askers and, you know, the, the walking, the hiking is, is, is wonderful and everything is just like, it's, it's in its own place, almost like it's been designed that way. Um, so we, uh, we did quite a few trips. Um, we did the, like I said, the whole five lineup. This is the Clark River. Um, so this is a, uh, one of the major tributaries of the Thelon River. And uh, this was Alex's favorite river, I think is safe to say. I mean, all the rivers were his favorites, I, I guess, that he got it on. But this one was like the one that made it on the cover of his book. Discovering Eden, and he would never tell anyone which river it was. You know, it was very secretive, and like you were sworn to secrecy on the route, and you didn't want to be the guy that like would ruin it, right, for everyone else. So, um, so we definitely had quite a ride um, following in his footsteps, and I like to use like the expression "following in Alex's footsteps" because some people were using "filling his shoes," and you know, it's like. I can't actually feel his shoes because his feet are way bigger than mine. I think he's like f a foot size of 12. But um, I don't think I, you know, for sure, I'll never have the amount of tripping. I'll never get the number of trips under my belt that in my career that Alex had in this area. And, you know, you could tell it was, this was, there's no, there was nothing more genuine than Alex's true love for the barren lands. It was the true love of his life. And, um, and it was never about really running the business as a, as a business per se. I think he was really took satisfaction in the fact that he did run a viable business for 43 years, and that is not an easy thing to do. But it really was just about how he could spend time with, in this area and share it with other people. Um, but we weren't having a lot of luck with wildlife last summer. We were having 
pretty poor luck. Um, we didn't see a single caribou on any of our trips. So the Beverly caribou herd is basically like gone right now. Uh, that was once 200 to 300 or 200 to 400,000 animals. And we weren't really finding any of the wolves either. And of course, Alex was, as you know, a wolf biologist. And wolves, nothing got Alex more excited than wolves. And um, he knew where a lot of the dens were. And he would mark the dens on the map. But like when you, you know, when you like mark a point on a map, like wolf den, even if it's a one to 50,000 K map, and you're actually on the ground trying to find it, it's really hard to find like something that small. So we weren't really finding wolves and we weren't seeing many wolves. So we looked and looked and like whole trips would go by and we weren't really, we were, yeah. I mean, it was, they were still great trips. They were hugely successful, but we weren't finding uh, some of what we were looking for. Um, and, and so this was on the, of course, this was on the Clark River. That's a massive uh, esker on the Clark that we camped at. This is also that Clark trip. This is our upper Thelon trip. Um, so we found a lot of other things. You know, we're finding, obviously, the fishing holes that Alex had pointed out. Um, we're finding, um, you know, we're, we're, we're having a good time. Um, we're finding relationships, new friends, um, and just like, this amazing space that is the Central Barrens, one of the last true wilderness areas left on Earth. Um, and then, um, and then I'm on, uh, so this is the Upper Thelon, uh, this is the Upper Thelon uh, trip as well. Um, and then I'm on the Horton River. I, uh, I have to leave this lineup that we're doing in the Central Barrens. I have to go away. I have to do guide the Lower Horton River because we have other trips running, right? Like trips that we were running before uh, I connected with Alex. So, um, oh yeah, before I talk about that river, we were finding muskox uh, out in the Barrens, lots of them. And so this was a herd of 25 muskox, basically that we heard in the middle of the night, I ran out in my boxer shorts and it, with a can of bear spray at four in the 4.45 in the morning, and I heard like the musk, you know, you can hear them, right? Like, <laughs> like you, they're loud, they're vocal, and they're crossing this river directly across, they're crossing the Clark, fording the Clark River right into a campsite for some reason. So we, we were definitely finding, uh, we, we started to find, um, you know, we were finding animals, but we weren't finding wolves. Um, and we're on the Horton River, and this is the Lower Horton River. Um, and we're finally on the river. It took, it was like really hard to get the license to do this river commercially. And we're on, and it's like awful. Like it's raining. It's, uh, if, I don't know if you guys were up on the high Arctic in August last year, but basically winter had started like after the end of July, summer was over. And it wasn't like it was gonna go away, like it was gonna rain for three days and then it would break up. It like rained um, the entire trip. So like this 13 day trip turned into a nine day trip because we were delayed a day getting in and then getting out, we got out three days early and we were like happy about that. We were like, so excited that we were getting out and we did a hundred of a kilometers of our 300 kilometer route just because it was like relentless wind and whipping rain so we're we're getting up and we're uh we're packing our wet stuff again for like the sixth morning in a row or something and we're often staying put for like two nights or three nights in, in one spot right because we really like don't want to go out and paddle that much and we're out and we're hiking around and, you know, we're going to check out an esker. There's not as many eskers out on the Horton River as there is on the Central Barrens, but, you know, we're doing one of these layover, wet layover days. We're hiking and we, uh, you know, I'm with half the group and I say, okay, well, let's go back to camp. But before we go, let's go another, like, let's just go a little bit over this next little esker ridge, right? Before we go back. And so, Everyone's like, yeah, okay, that's a good idea. So we, we approach the, the top of this little ridge and we hear the ravens, they're squawking 
And they were letting the wolves know that we were approaching, or at least that's what I believe. And I have read that there are documented interactions between ravens and wolves like that. So the first thing is we hear, we hear the ravens, and then we start seeing a lot of wolf tracks in the sand. And as we go crest this hill, we see the back of an adult wolf just take off from the other side of the hill like a rocket. Like the thing is just like out of there. And we just see its butt and its back and it's gone. And it's yipping and it's howling. So we sort of continue up, you know, we, we change our path a little bit, we continue up. And basically there was a wolf den right there on the other side of the hill. And we're standing there and we're kind of taking this in. And then the next moment, these two wolf puppies, they crest this hill. And so they're coming back to the den full speed. And this is August, mid-August. So they're pretty mobile. And um, we don't really know the den is like uh, just over to our right at this point. And the wolf puppies don't see us till like the last second. So there's these two wolf puppies coming right at us. And then about 15 meters away, they just hit the brakes. And they're like, you know, totally shocked to see humans, probably for the first time. And we're totally shocked to see them. And this was the exact same day that Alex's ashes were being spread out on the Elk River that I found my first wolf den. And of course, it wasn't on a river that Alex had ever paddled before. It was, you know, it wasn't in his in his uh, area, so to speak. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously it was just coincidence, but you know, it was a pretty cool coincidence, I think. Um, and then to make it even better, like we just like the next second we like looked over and like, whoa, like there's a muskox. So then there's like, oh, there is a big muskox walking around right at the right there. So it was just like this. Everything was happening at once, and it was a pretty cool experience to share up there on the Horton River last summer. And of course, um, you know, Alex, like, he would go and pick up the wolf puppies, right? And uh, there's a picture of Alex, on, obviously, on the left and his first wife on the right. And um, this, this was probably, this might have been actually one of the places, like, on the Clark River that we showed earlier. And I'm, I'm looking at the, the esker in the background. But, um, yeah, Alex just loved wolves, and he knew a lot about them. And, um, cared about them a lot. Obviously, we don't pick up like the wolf puppies. We um, uh, definitely couldn't get away with that. Alex, Alex for sure could, but um, but yeah. So those were some um, just some stories. I just wanted to share a few stories uh, that happened in the summer. Um, and basically, the point of this presentation was to like do a follow up from Monty's presentation about you know, how this transition is going from Alex Hall's canoe Arctic business to Jack Pine Paddle. So I kind of basically went through like some of the more interesting things where those connections happened last summer, but I wanted to finish the presentation by talking a little bit about the new national park in the Northwest Territories. Have you, who's heard of Thai Dene Nene National Park? Just a few of you guys, okay. Um, so first of all, you pronounce it Thai Dene Nene. Okay, let's repeat after me. Thai, dene, nene. Awesome. So, thigh like your leg, dene, nene. And that means the land of our ancestors to the uh, Chippewan dene who live in the community of Lutzelke. Lutzelke is a very remote uh, community that some of you may have been to. It's 300 people, there is no road access, like not even in the winter time. And um, it's on the east part of Great Slave Lake in the East Arm. It's a very isolated, very small community. And the community, like there really should be somebody here from the community talking about the Identity because it's a park for, um, you know, they're pretty a major part of this park. They're traditional territory and they are like also um, have a lot of, uh, like they actually manage the park in partnership with Parks Canada and the territorial government. So this is a pretty big park. It's three and a half times the size of Algonquin, and it was just signed into force last August. So it's, uh, it's brand new, and Parks Canada doesn't even have their website up yet, but you'll probably be hearing a little more about this park uh, as the years go on. And, um, and you, can, you, know, you can see here on the, on the right there of the blow-up map that 
Um, you know, to me, there's like two parts to the park. There's really like the part of it that captures Great Slave Lake, east arm. So, the, you know, as in the north, we just call it like the big lake. Um, and then there's like all of the, the back country where it moves east sort of towards the barren lands. And that's, of course, to capture the headwaters of the big rivers that flow into Great Slave Lake, the Lockhart and the Snowdrift River and other rivers. So this was a trip that we did on Thai Dene Nene. It was a 12-day canoe trip. And this was the last of Alex's trips that he had, his five trips. Um, and the cool thing about this trip, actually, is that you can see the park kind of extends a little bit, squiggles out there um, on the right, on the most eastern part, to capture where we are paddling. And Alex looked at the boundary. And so this park has been negotiated for a long time, almost four decades. And Alex looked at the boundary, and he said, you know what, this park is pretty... It's a pretty good boundary, but I think we should just change it a little bit because you're missing out the best part of the entire park. So if you just change the boundary by over here, you're going to capture this really amazing place in the park, which you can see from Google Maps how cool it is with just an, a whole complex of eskers and really like kettle uh, lakes, like they're aquamarine in color. So Alex mentioned that to Steve Ellis, who knew the negotiators who were making Thigh Denny Nene, and they actually changed the boundary on that advice. And I, I asked this to Steve, and he confirmed it. So the park is what the park is, in part because of Alex. And that, because of that, our trip to Thigh Denny Nene was, was in Thigh Denny Nene, because it was Alex's trip. And uh, Alex had um, helped the park uh, be there. So, you know, we landed on, on, on our trip. We helped the planes gas up and uh, went out to pick blueberries the first night before dinner. And this is kind of what the area looks like. It's sort of a transition trip. Like, it, we start below the tree line and then we end up above the tree line 12 days later. Um, and, yeah, I just wanted to share some photos that we had from this trip. And, you know, it's not like a whitewater trip. You know, the people on this trip are not uh, sponsored by Red Bull or have, like, six GoPros attached to their body. Um, we're out here for the wilderness, and we're definitely getting the wilderness and not seeing anyone for 12 days. Um, so we're on this trip, and, um, you know, these are kind of what the campsites look like, and we're... Uh, a lot of sand, like, you know, there's a lot of sand this summer. Um, and, you know, you'll notice our gear is a little different. Like, Alex would only use Duluth canvas packs. Like, Alex had a system that he sort of refined in the late 70s, and he didn't see any reason to change that system, like, up until his last year, which is 2017. So if you showed up for one of his trips with, like, you know, a canoe barrel or something, like, it was not really going to come on the trip, right? Like... <laughs> uh, at all. So we definitely have changed some things. And Alex had a point with the Duluth packs because his, his thinking was like, you can actually maximize the most space in the side of the canoe because, you know, the barrels especially, they don't really, you know, there's all these like extra gaps that you can't fill. And of course he wasn't doing whitewater trips, so it wasn't as much of a issue. But uh, I come from a, like a mountain canoeing whitewater background. So I, so the trips are different. They're, they're in the same area. Um, we weren't seeing a lot of wildlife on this trip either really early on. We were actually like the most significant thing was sandpipers for the first few days. Um, but we were getting into the fish, into some of the Arctic grayling. And Alex actually marked this spot as the best fishing spot in the Northwest Territories. So of course we had to fish there. And that was the grayling, but we caught, uh, we started catching the trout and we caught a lot of trout and we had uh, a lot of trout fish fry on the trip, and it was super good. And then one morning, um, we, so a lot of the trip, like, you know, the average age of the clients are about 59, right? So it's older folks. So Sophia is the one that's taking, this is Sophia. She was taking all these beautiful photos that you're seeing. And so one morning, we're sitting there, and Sophia just comes out in her bikini, and we're eating breakfast, and she gets out her sleeping pad, and then she jumps on the lake. She's floating on the lake, and she asks if I can get the drone out, take some cool photos. So I set the drones. We have this, you know, drone buzzing around. Sophia's there. You know, all the clients are kind of seeing there watching this. And uh, one of the clients, Dave Smith, 
who's an older gentleman, has paddled a lot on the boundary waters, and um, you know, he turns to me and he says, he just says like, man, canoe tripping has really changed in the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I think he's right to a certain extent. I think in many ways it hasn't changed as well. But, and for Alex, it really hadn't changed very much with his system. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder too, I was like, what would Alex think, you know, on some of these trips, right? Um, and then I stopped thinking about that. So the trip was, uh, you know, it's just the kind of getting to the end of the shoulder season. And uh, yeah, it started to get windy. And of course, at the end of August, the, um, the you know, the low pressure systems come in and things start to break up a bit. And yeah, we definitely see a lot of muskox on this trip. There are so many muskox in the park, and it is a huge success story of the Thelon Game Sanctuary that was formed in 1927 to really protect them from extinction. And now they are like doing really well by all accounts. And we saw over 50 muskox in 12 days and four herds. And two of those herds basically walked into our camp. So we were seeing muskox pretty consistently all across the barrens all summer, but especially closer towards the tree line. Um, and this is some photos of the area that Alex um, really, uh, you know, he really like, it, this was a special place for him. And this is the area that he, he, um, he helped cre um, protect in the park forever. Um, and we, 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 you know, following Alex's plans, we spent a full layover day at the end of the trip. We got there a day early. That's where the plane was going to pick us up. And we just like spent this wonderful day exploring and hiking around and, and the, 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 the colors were out, um, the, the berry leaves were turning. And it's like, just, there's just, you could have spent two weeks out there and there's so much to see and so much to find. And it's just, uh, it's just such a great place. And, you know, the cool thing is like Alex has enabled now all of these other people to have these experiences because we have a whole guide team, right? So we only hire northerners. Like we're the only canoe outfitter in the Northwest Territories that only hires northerners because I grew up in Yellowknife, I live in the north. So we're trying to do things a little differently, um, at least in terms of commercial operations right now. And this is one of our guides, Gia, and her mom is from Little K. So that's super cool that we have someone who's actually on their traditional territory now learning to work as a canoe guide. And uh, she did a great job on that trip uh, with me out there last year. That was her first trip. And the other thing I just want to mention too is like, you know, we were, we spent the whole summer going over Alex's campsites. And I started to notice his particular style of uh, fire ring because he had a, he had a, a grill and it was like certain dimensions and Alex was super particular about how he built his campsites, his, his, the, the fire ring for this grill. And it was like this rectangle and it was always the same. And then there was like a, a certain stone where he'd put a spoon and then there's another stone where he'd put like another utensil. And then all his firewood would be like always on the same side and always like broken up and organized so meticulously and carefully. And we would find these you know, th this history now of the land of, uh, from Alex. And Alex would, he would never remove any archeological evidence or artifacts that he would find. And he was very stringent about this with the clients that, you know, not only was it illegal, but it was immoral really to take these. So he was um, very careful with them, but he would take them and he would like build s some caches. And so he could show them to people and we were, we were probably w going past these all summer until one of the clients had been on a previous trip, Mark, he showed us where they were and he, he just said, hey Dan, check this out. And he lifted up this rock and there lo and behold were all, all of these really great examples of scrapers, spearheads and arrowheads. And it was like these four rocks in a row that you know you would just walk over, but that was Alex's, where he, how he would mark them. Um, so that was kind of a neat, neat, neat discovery that you know pr um, that we were shown, and so we, um, yeah, we spent our last day and and our last evening um, out there on the last trip of the summer, and I guess I was just super grateful, you know, thinking about that and thinking about Alex that he had given me this opportunity to carry on his. Uh, what he had done for a long time, and that I hadn't messed it up in any major way. 
um, at least not on the first summer. And I, that's really what I felt was just a, a very grateful and just very thankful for Alex for uh, giving uh, myself and Jacqueline Paddle and all of our guides uh, this opportunity, which we hope to continue to do for many, many years. So, um, so there is just a short video, and it's sort of like a little promotional video, but it also just shows Thaidene Nene and this area that Alex wanted to protect. So I just wanted to end the presentation by showing you guys the video, uh, three minute video of that trip. So hopefully it plays. I would describe the barren lands in the way that sometimes the Great Plains are described. They have a terrible beauty to them. So the remoteness, the emptiness, and the loneliness, I don't think we'll see anybody the whole 12 days. So right now we're in the new park boundary of Thai Dene Nene. That means the land of our ancestors. I'm just excited to experience it all. There's, you know, the different campsites, getting out and exploring, seeing the different parts of everywhere from here to uh, Eileen Lake. You know, our typical routine is we, uh, we get up in the morning, we have our tea and coffee, delicious breakfast, pack all of our stuff into the canoes, and we move, we paddle. Occasionally we'll have days where we spend our day on, on land hiking, uh, checking out all the uh, neat uh, features out here like eskers, creeks, lakes, go scout for wildlife. One of the reasons I came on this trip is that I am very interested in animals. That was one of the key elements to this journey and it has been fulfilled beyond what my expectations were. The whole trip has been spectacular. Met and exceeded all expectations. I was hoped to have lost a little weight on this trip, but I think it's gonna be just the opposite. We have the opportunity to take people here and to share this with others. And if you come here, you understand why it's important to protect this land. Of course, I had to first learn to canoe. Then I had to think about the bugs and all these other things, but I'm glad I came. So 